The Here. last thing I want to do, and we did a little bit of this in class the other day, and um, some of you looked like a, it, it, it was like a train wreck, so I want to go through this a little more systematically with you. One of the things that you're going to have to be able to do by the time you get to the end of this course, and you're going to have to hang on to this until the end of the year when you take the AP exam, is how you can show a connection between these markets and what happens in the economy as a whole. That's the whole purpose of macroeconomics, and you need to be able to do that to show that you know what's really happening. So what I've got here to break this down for you is the money market first, where you have the interest rate on your vertical axis, quantity of money on the horizontal, demand slopes down, supply is vertical because it's controlled by the Fed, and then your equilibrium is marked. Then, side by side with loanable funds, and make sure they're all labeled. Well, I thought the reader could assume what I was talking about. Don't assume anything. Be as obvious as possible and keep everything labeled so that somebody can tell what you did. The one safe assumption is that the AP reader doesn't know what you're talking about. It's always better that way. So, loanable funds. Vertical axis, you've still got your interest rate. It's the same thing. Down here, quantity of loanable funds. Same equilibrium interest rate. We're carrying that through. That's the advantage of doing side-by-side -side graphs. So we've got our equilibrium rate and our equilibrium quantity clearly marked. Next, we want to tie that into an ADAS model showing the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, short-run curves, okay, short-run aggregate supply. You have the vertical range, the upward sloping range, and then getting more horizontal. It doesn't have to be a perfect backwards L shape because the AP readers are not necessarily looking for that anymore. But you do need to show that it has that same basic curve. And then aggregate demand sloping down. On our vertical axis, price level, looking at inflation. And on our horizontal axis, GDP or national output, price level, national quantity is another way to look at it with our equilibrium clearly marked. Now, how do we show that a change over here carries through everything else? Let's say, for example, I'm trying to think of how I want to do this. Well, let's go back to the idea of the government running a deficit. Okay? Um, deficit spending. What's happening in the money market? The government is borrowing money. How do they get money to run a deficit? They borrow it. Who do they most often borrow it from? Americans. It is a misconception that the United States owes most of its debt to foreign countries. The vast majority of the national debt is held in the United States. Whenever someone buys a T-bill or government security, that's you loaning your money to the government. That certificate that you get for the government bond is like an IOU. And because the bond has a higher date at maturity, that's the interest the government pays to borrow your money. So that's what can happen here. Government runs a deficit, it borrows the money. So in the money market, we have an increase in the demand for money because the government is borrowing it. So we want to show that the demand for money shifts to the right. And again, show a parallel shift. Don't draw me all these weird ones. So we have an increase in the interest rate. Quantity stays the same because supply is vertical. That's what happens graphically with that other line being vertical. Now, how do you demonstrate that with loanable funds? Again, you can do it one of two ways. You can either increase demand for loanable funds and say the government is borrowing up the loanable funds, or you can say that it reduces the national available supply. Either way is fine. I'm more happy with showing a change in demand, causing a change in demand. I think it's a lot easier to conceptualize that way. Do it however you want, but you've got to be able to explain what you do. All right, so government is running a deficit. It borrows money over here. It's demanding more loanable funds over here. To be consistent, you can show the same interest rate across the board, such that we want to show that demand is shifting to the right, that's our new equilibrium. Same interest rate all the way across, and our new quantity. Now, if we have an increase in government spending, government runs a deficit, borrows it here, um, you have an increased demand here, 
driving up interest rates, increase in government spending is going to increase aggregate demand over here, such that we have an increase in the price level and an increase in GDP. Now, be careful when you do this that you're not trying to change five or six factors at the same time because it, it's overly complicated. You can't represent 16 different things at once. So, how would this be written as a question? Government is engaged in deficit spending. Ceteris paribus. Don't change anything else. Increase, increase, increase. You see how consistent that is? This is why I would rather have you show deficit spending and loanable funds as an increase in demand. Boom, boom, boom. It's the same rightward shift all the way across all three graphs. Now, how do we explain that in terms of interest rates and inflation? Going back to our equation of exchange, we said MV equals PQ. And we said that a change in the supply of money causes a change in price. Now, doesn't that tie into what we just did? Pretty much. We have an increase in interest rates that drives an increase in the price level. This change here, you know, if you change this, if it goes up, this one has to go up. There's a term in your book that you'll see, the Fisher effect. Now, this apparently was important enough that, you know, some guy named Fisher did this thing after, which some of my students in the past have found very amusing. Fisher effect says that this has to be equivalent. So if you have, for example, a 1% increase in interest rates, it's going to yield a 1% increase in inflation. That it's like a one-to-one -one direct ratio. I'd like to That's nominate it's supposed to work. something called the Walker effect, which uh -huh. has to do if you've got cookies. For every cookie I eat, there's one less cookie. Thank you. That's the Walker effect. You can just add that to your macroeconomics, and 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 I th and I like that. Well, you know, and anybody wants to nominate me for a Nobel Prize, um, I'll take it. Hey, we got room on the mantle. All right, this is the kind of process that you're going to need to get to. How does a change in one market impact others? How do you demonstrate that across the board graphically? And how do you explain it? The increase in interest rates ties into the increase in the price level, goes back to the Fisher effect, ties into the equation of exchange. That's really key to pulling together all of the concepts in Unit 4. Let's zoom and pan slowly through those so, graphs one more time. Play with this. You know, don't start with all the arrows. Start with the basic graphs, practice the shifts, and then practice tying them together. That's the best thing you can do for learning how all these parts coalesce.